five, four. <laughs> Welcome to our study on the book of Romans. We've been looking at Romans chapter 5 and verse 6, uh, where it talked about us being yet without strength, and in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Um, I want to take just a moment now and talk to you about the due time aspect of what's happening here. Um, when the Bible talks about in due time Christ died for the ungodly, we talked about that being the required time that a redeemer is given to provide redemption for, uh, for the defendant. Um, and that due time was uh, uh, fulfilled perfectly by the Lord. I may have a let me just see if I have this on the PowerPoint of where we're going to go next. Um, I guess I did it. Let me just kind of run through this and get our thinking back on track. The Gentiles stood accused. The evidence proved them to be guilty in God's sight. Once they were shown to be guilty, then uh, they were going to experience the day of wrath, both in the tribulation and in the lake of fire. They were given an opportunity to exonerate themselves. They couldn't produce anything that would detract from that sentence <coughs> because they could not. They were declared to be yet without strength. Upon that being declared, the court then petitions for a Redeemer. Jesus Christ meets all of the qualifications for the Redeemer and provides the redemption at the required time, in due time, he provides that uh, redemption. Um, that way there is no possible way that the final verdict is going to be overturned in this thing, that we are justified and we have a hope that delivers us from both the day of wrath and the day of righteous judgment. Now, that's, that's the, the kind of the, the, the timeline of how all of that happens. At the end of Romans chapter 5 and verse 6, the phrase says, Christ died for the ungodly. In view of what you're just reading in this verse, here's what kind of ought to be in your mind. I just want you, I got the red light now. I got to believe that's not right. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> Was there a ball game coming on or what? I, you know, <laughs> something I missed. Okay. When you're reading that verse and you understand what yet without strength is, that judicial proclamation, in due time, and you understand that he's going to provide the redemption, it says, Christ died for the ungodly. You know what that verse is telling you is, he did that. You were declared to be yet without strength. A redeemer was petitioned for by the court. Jesus Christ, when he dies for the ungodly, is providing that redemption. It's a done deal. He has perfectly met all the requirements of the court. Now, the answer to what we're talking about at the very end of the last session, why did he do that? Okay, well, look. In dying for the ungodly, the Lord Jesus Christ functioned to pay the redemption price for us by dying on the cross as our substitute redeemer. Yes? Okay. Suffered a real death in the process of paying, the, paying in full the debt and penalty of our sins. He, functioning as our substitute redeemer, took in our stead the full and just sentence which we deserved upon himself, satisfying the just demands of the court of God's justice. All I'm giving you here is a point by point of he did everything exactly right. He did it at the exact right time. He did everything just the way it was supposed to be done. And now the reason that he did that, I don't know why I'm behind, is Romans 5.5. 5. And hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Now I do want to stick with my notes on this part because I want to break this verse down into some bite-sized pieces. Now, I don't think I did a PowerPoint on this. I have, here's what we need to understand, and that's not where we're... Let me, j give me just a second and make sure. No, not there yet. So I'm going to back you back up to this verse, and I want us to see some things. We are not going to be ashamed because why? 
love of God is shed abroad in our hearts, right? All right. Now we have to understand what that process is. Verse 6, verse 5, verse 5 tells us the why. We're not going to be ashamed of that hope. Verse 6 <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Verse 6 begins to explain that. It, it begins to define and explain how verse 5 gets done. Now, we've been in verse 6. Remember? That was, we're declared to be without strength. Okay? And we understand that at the required time, Christ functioned as our re substitute redeemer and died for the ungodly. We know God loves us, but now there is an aspect of God's love that we're going to begin to be pointed to. Everything that was, n that was necessary for us to be delivered from the day of wrath has taken place lawfully and at the right time. Now, that means that he did all of that. So here's what we need to understand. We need to understand there's some... Well, this is a sentence. Let me just give it to you. The love of God desirous to deliver us from the wrath to come put into motions the actions of the Father and the Son. Why couldn't the Father say to the Son, you go, well, did the Father just say to the Son, you go be the Redeemer? Okay, they are one and the same. When the Son is here on the earth, if He's having second thoughts about being the Redeemer, what, what happens then? <laughs> okay, our goose is cooked. What else? He's no longer qualified to be the Redeemer. The Redeemer has to be willing. Right. Is the Father willing? Is the Son willing? Yeah, so I'm, that's why I have them both up here. The love of God desirous to deliver us from the wrath to come, put into motion the actions of the Father and the Son... And that love of God that put those actions into motions contains sufficient power that once we are fully persuaded of it, which is what the love of God being shed and brought in our hearts is, a, is to produce, it produces deliverance from the effects of the policy of evil and its attempt to make us ashamed of our hope. Does that make sense to you? So that love of God in a desire to protect us from that which was our sentence put into motion that love motive actions of the Father and the Son and that love, that the aspect of that love that we're going to be looking at contains enough power that once we are fully persuaded of it, it will deliver us from any attack against those hopes so that they never cause us to doubt. That, does that, that makes sense, right? And I want to point you back to one part, and that is in this third part, that when we are fully persuaded of that aspect of God's love that we're looking at, when you're... Look, you know the, one of the hardest things to do with people is to change their mind about something. You... Can you by force make someone change their mind? I remember a cartoon by Dennis the Menace, and uh, he was sitting in the corner, and the caption read, I'm sitting on the outside, but I'm standing on the inside. Because what's in your mind, that's what's there. And even though someone may be able to force you to take an action you don't want to take, they can't by force change what's up here. Well, what the Word of God is now trying to do is to do that very difficult task 
of changing your thinking so that you become fully persuaded of the promise that was given that you are going to be delivered from the day of wrath and from the day of righteous judgment, the lake of fire, to produce absolute confidence that you believe and know and trust implicitly that those things are true. And the only thing that has the power to do that is the aspect of the love of God that we're about to do. And when you get that understanding, as you begin to understand that, the Holy Ghost is going to begin to effectually work that truth in your own heart and mind. And when that gets done, that is what the love of God being shed abroad is. It's not just, I know God loves me. Are there people who know God loves them but think they're going through the tribulation? Plenty. That's not the issue. The issue is this aspect of God's love that we are about to look at. And so I told you that in these next verses, remember now, this, goes, this, go, this whole proof goes through verse 10. All we've done in the last, what? three, four, five hours, is look at two verses. Hallelujah, we're moving to verse 7. You thought we were out of gas. But if you say, well, look, there's still some things about this I don't quite have fixed in my mind. I want to remind you again, it's okay because the whole picture won't come together until verse 10. All I'm asking you to do is get Understand in verse 5, it's the love of God that gets shed abroad in our hearts that makes us not ashamed of our hope. In verse 6, he begins to lay out this groundwork. We're going to be declared yet without strength, and Christ, our Redeemer, in due time that is appointed, died for the ungodly. He provided, that, that's a done deal. That's, he provided that redemption. So that he did that. Now, what is it about this love of God, the motive for doing this, that makes it different from anything else? Well, let's take a look. I sure hope this is right. Verse 7. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> One out of five. Not bad, huh? All right, here we go. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now here's the next two verses. As we take a look at this, verse 7 is going to give us an illustration of what God in his magnificent aspect of love has done for us and put on display that makes it completely different from anything else that has ever taken place before. And as you can see from verse 7, he's not talking about no one else has ever sacrificed themselves for someone. And he's not saying no one ever didn't do it because they love someone. That usually is the motive for making some kind of a sacrifice like that. But I do want you to notice what's at stake here is not just paying back a financial debt. It is the giving of a life. So that's why he says, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Scarcely tells you what? Not very often. All right. Now, he's going to go on from there, and he's going to say, he's going to say, in verse 7, let's see, yeah, per, I got, I, I'm sorry, I got, I got the thing, per adventure. Per adventure is telling you this is a possible case. If I get stranded on the side of the road, per adventure, someone I know may come by and give me a hand. It's not saying they will, I'm not saying they won't, it's saying it's possible, you know, depending, I guess where you break down, it's more per adventure than others, okay. But in verse 7, Paul is saying some cases of redemption do exist. There is a hypothetical case in which for a good man, some would even dare to die. That is possible. He's saying it's possible for that to happen. What's the first problem with that? It's, It's possible, it's peradventure, for a good man, some would even dare to die. But In order to do that, what do you have to do? You have to find someone that's willing to die for a guilty party, right? Secondly, you have to find someone that's qualified. Third thing is human redemption has all kinds of hurdles to overcome. When you're talking about humans doing it, 
and you're talking about crossing every T and dotting every I and making everything just right, it is hypothetical. But it can be done and has been done. Now, I want to talk about the words righteous and good here. For a good man, for a righteous man. He is not, when he talks about the righteous man, he's not talking about a man who is justified unto eternal life. That's not what's being talked about here. And when he talks about a good man, he's not talking about someone who is saved and living for the Lord. That, that, the words righteous and good in this, in this verse, let me just put these up here. The words righteous and good are not how God sees them, but how they are perceived by the person who is taking their place. Doesn't that make sense? Uh, there's something about this person. He says, you know, here's a good, a good, if you perceive someone as being a really good person, peradventure, it's hypothetically possible, you might dare to die in their place. I have a really short list of people I'm prepared <laughs> to take their place on, you know, in the electric chair. I'm just, this just not a long list. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. I'm just saying, I will pray for you, okay? Now, <laughs> look, that, I mean, that has to be something, doesn't it? Okay. You can understand, he says, it's possible that you do that for a good man. But that would be someone who was good in this person's eyes, right? By the way, do, if just because it's good in the eyes of the person willing to take their place, does that mean they're a good person? No, see, and that's the point. And, because, and they may even be righteous in the eyes of the person who is doing it. Does that guarantee they really are righteous? No. But, but, in the, but my point is, in this verse, is talking about in the eyes of the person that's doing the redeeming. There is something intrinsically, uh, uh, something about them that has value to the person who's taking their place. There is something that makes them have value. They're either someone related to you, and so they're important, in some way, or what they do in life is of such a significant nature that they are worth leaving on the planet to continue to do that. They are perceived to be good in some way in the eyes of the person doing the redeeming. Now I want you to notice verse 8. What is the first word in verse 8? When you find the word but, we talked about this before, I call it a corner word. When you talk about but, what do you know is coming? You're changing direction. I really like Monty, but <laughs> what do you know is coming? See, that whole, that whole line of thought now is fixing to take a turn. For a righteous man, scarcely would one die. For a good man, it's hypothetically possible that someone would die. It's been done, but by the way, are those very good odds in verse 7 if you're the one under the death penalty? <laughs> See, that doesn't look good for you, does it? I love the word but in verse 8. Verse 7 could say things aren't looking too good. You ever seen that sign? I used to have a, a building cleaning business, and the secretaries always posted these cute little signs up you know, and when they come in their cubicle, you'd see it. And it said, you know, evidently this is someone someone's always coming to to get something done. And, they were, and the sign said, I can only do, I can only please one person a day. Today is not your day. <laughs> and underneath it, it goes, tomorrow's not looking too good either. Okay. That's what I see in verse 7. I'm, I'm, even if I'm considered to be a righteous person or a good person, if I have the death sentence on me, things are not looking good. If that's what my lawyer told me, and then he used this word, but I'm all ears. And here's what he says. But God commendeth, 
his what? Ah, there's that aspect we pick back up from verse 5. The love of God being shed abroad in our heart. Now he's going to tell you something about an aspect of that love. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now there's a couple of points. I could, I could kind of belabor this. And I don't want to do it. But that is to say, when um, let's call the righteous man... Man A, okay? And let's call the good man, Man B. And uh, let's call the sinner, Man C. Verse 7 talks about Man A and B. This guy is righteous, this guy is good, at least in the eyes of the person doing the redeeming. Here's one of the things that sets apart what God is doing as so different. Because God is saying, this person who has been found guilty has actually committed his crime against the one doing the redeeming. So when he says, for some... They would die for a righteous person. For others, they might die for a good person. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were, what's the next word? Yet. What's yet telling you? To the extreme extent, and what's the word that follows? Sinners. Christ died for us. He's saying, here's the aspect about God's love that makes it different. Did he look down and say, I see something about you that has value. I see something that makes you righteous to me. I see something that makes you good to me. No, because we are yet without strength. <laughs> There's nothing. So he goes, you guys are used to, by the way, is the list pretty short of who's going to die in someone else's place? Yes, yes. <laughs> I mean, I, a husband says to his wife, Honey, I would die for you, but let's not go there if we don't have to. Right? I mean, you know. <laughs> Bob's saying, I'll buy you a really nice headstone. I'm, you know, just, I'll, I'll come see you every day. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Sorry, he had that look. I, you know, I can't. Well, okay, he told me that at the break. But, okay, but when God is doing it, but, the but is the corner. This is going in a different direction. He says, but God does this, that while we are to the fullest extent, to the maximum amount, sinners against who? Sinners against who? Against God. While we are sinning against him, while we're committing the crime worthy of death against God, the very one who, who has had the crime committed against is the one that now steps up and says, I will provide all of the necessary redemption. That's what makes it different. That, that ask, it's not just God loves me. God loves everybody, right? But God says now, but now, but what is it about that love now that guarantees we're not going through the day of wrath? What is it about that? Well, first of all, notice he commendeth his love toward us. Now, that word commend, I made a list here. Let me see if I can pull them up of words that get, uh, the word demonstrate. The NIV actually used demonstrate, but God demonstrated his love toward us. Or you could say God proved his love toward us. Or God showed his love toward us. And, uh, but again, as you might have guessed, commend is a word that carries a shade of meaning the other words don't carry. It is something that gives you a fuller understanding of this. And it, the word commend, I know you're going to find this a surprise, is actually a word that has a legal connotation to it. So once again, God is going to do something in a judicial sense. And I'm going to just read this definition to you because I just pulled it straight out. Here it is. 
commend it. I should have put, did I put this on the PowerPoint? Yeah, I did. Here we are. Man, I'm good. Commend is formal or official praise for that which is presented and recommended to be suitably good. It's not just, I was surprised by that. Formal or official praise. It's not just something off the, like, by the way, if you commend is the root word of what word? Okay, well, okay, but I'm looking for another word. It contains the word commend. It just has something added to it. Huh? Recommend. By the way, if you look back at the verse, but God commendeth. If you think of that in the term that we just saw, that is formal or official praise for that which is presented. In other words, he's not just saying, hey, here's something. He's telling you there is something here of real value, something here of real worth. I'm commending it to you. It's more, I am recommending it, but it's not just a recommendation. This is a recommendation of something that is suitably good for the reason it is presented. Does that, does that, am I making sense at all here? Um, I need to go to the store. My car's broke down. Okay, you know what? I have a pogo stick. I recommend. Not, not a good choice. However, could you commend your vehicle for them to be able to go to the store in? And you would know that that was suitably good for the purpose. You would know that it is... Uh, well, again, that's not really formal or official praise, so we don't use the word commend in that way. But when we talk about he commendeth his love toward us, that's exactly what he's doing. He is saying, hey, I am, gi I am giving you something that is not just suitably good, but is, has an official praise behind it for what it is. So there's something about God's love now that's valuable enough to do that. It, there has merit. Let me just see if I gave you this one, two, three, and I didn't. Um, because it has merit to it, because there's something about it that sets it apart from everything else, and that's why commendeth is the best word to use. There's something that makes God's love different and sets it apart. There's something about God's love and what it does here that has merit to it that the others don't have. These... These have a different merit to them. Yes, they, they looked on these. They did a good thing. They did a sacrificial thing. But it was for the reason that they saw something there. God looked here and he saw absolutely nothing. So what is the motive for God's love? Where does it come from, God's love? You can grow to love someone because they're nice to you. You can grow to love someone because they are a joy to be around. You can, God looks at us, and did he look at us and go, you know what, they're just so good, I can't help but love them. They're just so righteous, I can't help but just love them. Uh, huh? Well, okay, but before, well, that's true. But before we were his children, what was it that caused him to love us and say, I am going to redeem them? He is the creator. Where, where, okay, let me phrase it like this. Where does that love come from? Well, it comes solely out of him, right? Oh, look, I'm going to give you an illustration of this, and this is going to be a terrible illustration. When children are born into the world, you, ju you know what? When you get that grandbaby or that new baby, you just love them, right? You just love them. One day they come, they wrap their arms around their neck, they kiss you, and they say, I love you, Mommy. And boy, that melts your heart. Now, you got to hear that more. They got to do that more. And if they ever get out of the car to go to 
the, you know, wherever the friend's house or school or wherever they're going, and they don't throw their arms around your neck and say, I love you, mommy, what do you say? Where's my hug? Right? Because you want more of that. And then when they, you know, then the day comes that they're, at some point they go, everybody's looking, I'm not hugging my mommy. <laughs> so they just kind of get out of the car and, and go, you know, I'm sorry, am I ruining something here? I'm okay, but you know. So I'm, you know, but you know what happens is our motivation changes because then, because then, as soon, the first time they do that, we figure, uh oh, what? Something's wrong. What's wrong? That baby, when it came in the world, it didn't need to do anything. I mean, it didn't matter what. Oh, he pooped. Isn't that cute? It, now. You know, it's not like that anymore. The motivation changed. Look, why are you looking at me like this is so strange? Every one of you dated this way. Some guy sees this girl. He thinks he likes her. You know what? He, she, she, it doesn't matter what she does. He's got, if she doesn't give him the time of the day, he is not thwarted. He is going to, you know, he's going to continue. He's going to wear her down. That's the way it goes. And then, you know what? They decide they like each other, so they write letters. But she only wrote him three letters today, and he wrote her five. What's wrong? What's wrong? Stand around. Oh, never mind. I'm going to go down a different road. The only, my point is the motivation changes. Before, it did, you didn't need anything to be motivated. Now, all of a sudden, you've got to have reciprocal to get motivated. You know, or, well, you're not going to write me but three letters. I'm going to write you but two. We just do it like that. Well, okay. Bad illustration. The point being, God looks at us and the only motivation comes from within him himself. It's not, thank God, it's not based on us. God, God doesn't look and say to the angels, when they were little, they were cute. Look at them now. Mm. it's all out of him he doesn't need to look at us to say there's something righteous there's something good there's something desirable here there's some virtue there's some there's something that has value to me in this he looked at that and said i see you for what you are you are yet sinners and i'm loving you just out of myself. That, folks, is a love I'm not sure we're capable of. If we have it, we don't maintain it for very long before it changes into something else. It's just kind of the nature of the beast. What he is doing is he is setting forth here. Is that really where I'm at? He is setting forth here the fact that he is doing much more than demonstrating his love to us. He is commending his love for us because that love has a virtue to it that sets it apart from every other love that shows it to be that for what it is. And it stems not for, not verse 7, from any good thing that it sees in us, but it sees us for exactly what we are and it loves us to such a full extent that when the crime is committed against God, God himself is the one that steps up to provide the redemption. Now that, that is a great love. I know that's not a surprise to, to it, probably anybody in this room. I think, going back to verse 6, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were... Yet sinners, we talked about that, Christ died for us. Now, let's look at all of these verses together so far, because we still have two more verses to go to, to put all this together in a unit. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now we're honing in on the part that God wants us to get to. And that is that these three verses are laying out a premise 
upon which an argument is going to be set forth to prove that you will never be able to go into the day of wrath or ever go, to go into the lake of fire. And I think I should have a what we should understand here. Mm, okay, maybe next. The love motive behind your perfectly timed and legally satisfying redemption rests in the excellent nature and virtue and integrity of God's love in and of himself. Not in you, not in me, it all comes from him, 100% from him. And it's not just that we don't do anything to turn that off. It's in spite of everything that we are, that love still comes. Now let me see if there is. Okay, therefore, I think this is right. I sure hope so. No, I have one other thing to give you before I do that. Our justification unto eternal life has some hope for promises that are connected with our redemption that is in Christ Jesus. One of those hopes is that we escape the day of wrath. Another one of those hopes, uh, and, and, by the way, and there's an attack that comes against that. And they have as a, a, a intent to make us so ashamed of those hopes that we don't believe them and that we don't talk about them. The remedy for that is to understand something about God's love that will, get, that will cause it to be shed abroad in our heart so that we withstand every one of those attacks. So when we fully understand what it is about God's love that makes it so that it is what it is to the extent that it is, that when he... Hmm, when you understand that that love is not based on anything about us, but comes solely from God, then the whole motive comes from God. The whole motive is from Him. Okay, I think you understand that. So let me, let me just do this point, and, we'll, and I'll pull this together. The whole issue behind the determination, because not only has He said it, I think I know what's throwing me for a loop here. You have your Bibles open to Romans 5. I should have just read verse 9. I know we're, we're going to get to it. We're going to dwell on it next week. But I want you to look at verse 9. Don't, I just want you to see one thing. I just, we're going to get in a plane and just kind of fly over and take a look at the landscape here. He's going to repeat a promise he's already made to you. Verse 9. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from what? We're going to be saved from that wrath. He's fixing to end this section by reaffirming a promise he's already made to you. You are not, that wrath has two components to it, and we read them back in Romans 3. That you're going to go through the day of wrath. It's, these days are on the calendar for every unsaved person. You're going to go through the day of wrath. If you're alive, it's the tribulation. If you're dead, it's hell. And you're going to go to the lake of fire. You have a hope that says both of those get marked off your calendar, and God's replacing them with something different. You get a blessed hope that saves you from this day if you're alive and you're going to go out before it happens and you are not going to the lake of fire, you're actually going to have a day of righteous glory out there in the heavenly places. Someone else is going to be in the lake of fire forever. You're going to be up there forever. It's a replacement. So with that thing in mind, I'm just going to say this, because he made that promise. Now he's trying to tell you those hopes are true. So I'm saying the whole issue behind the determination Here's how determined God is to save us from that wrath to come. The whole issue behind the provision to make it so we could be saved from that wrath to come. In other words, God had to make some kind of provision to do that. Something had to be done. What had to be done? Oh, okay, but I'm looking for, I'm just looking for a single word. We've already talked about it. Redemption. He took our place. Did that have to be done? If he doesn't do that, are we going through the wrath? So something has to be done to keep us from going through that wrath. So the whole issue behind the determination, 
Oh, I'm just, I'm not saying it right. Okay, well, start over. Ready? Look. When God set this thing forward, he was determined. That's what Paul is talking about back there in Romans and bringing this, all this issue up to chapter 5. He is talking about, I am determined that you are not going to go through this day of wrath and you're not going to go through that eternal day of wrath in the lake of fire. I'm determined you're not going to do it. I'm going to tell you the whole issue behind that determination. God says, I'm determined to change that for you. And that the whole issue behind the provision to make it so that we could be delivered from those wraths. The whole issue behind the promise that, he, that he's given unto us that now being justified... He will deliver us from the day of wrath, that, that, that whole peace, all of that, the issue behind the de determination, behind the provision, and behind the promise rests solely upon the profound love he has for us and not upon anything in and of us ourselves. Do I, do I need to break that down? I, the whole, everything behind God, what, what was it? Look, what was it? Let's take the determination. What was it that made God say, I am determined that everybody in this dispensation of grace is not going to go through that day of wrath and they're not ever going to the lake of fire? Never. I'm determined. What was the thing? Thing that caused him to determine that. That's right. His love. <coughs> he says, I've got to make a provision then to keep them from going through that. What was it that made him say, I have to make that provision? His love. And he makes a promise. So he tells us, I am determined determined that you will never go through this. I'm going to make a provision that you'll never go through this. So I'm giving you a promise that you'll never go through this. And I want you to call this promise your hope that you hold on to. And what is it that's behind that promise? Is it anything about us? No. It's all about what? Him. God's love for you and me in the dispensation of grace determined from the very beginning there was no way he was ever going to allow us to go into the day of wrath or the lake of fire. There was no way. He said, I'm determined. And because that was his determination, he says, I will do whatever needs to be done to ensure that that is exactly what happens. And he says, and in, and in view of that, I'm going to make a promise. And I'm going to promise you that you never have to fear. In fact, when I call these your hopes, I'm going to tell you now the policy of evil is going to come and try to shake you out of both of those hopes. You don't really know you're saved. You don't really know if you're going through the tribulation or not. I'm tell and, and, and he knows that. And he's going to tell you, here's the thing that has to be in your mind. There is a part of my love for you that loves you to this extent that I determined that you will not go through the wrath. And he says, and whatever it will take to do that, I'm going to make that provision. Well, what it comes down to is the one that crimes were committed against is the one that's got the only one qualified to do the redeeming. And God doesn't even blink. He doesn't even blink. He goes, I determine that whatever it takes, this is what... Now, we say that all the time, don't we? We say, I'm determined, no matter what it takes, this is going to get done. You're talking about the God of all creation saying, I'm determined, no matter what it takes, this is going to get done. And I am going to make a provision that makes sure 
everything gets done in accordance. It's going to get done at the right time. It's going to get done in the right way. It's going to be qualified. It's going to meet every, every requirement out there. There's no case to overturn it. And in view of that, I'm giving you this promise. And when I tell you, in like, like we just read in verse 9, that we shall be saved from wrath through him... The, the real question is, do you really believe, because people say, I just don't think it's, I, I just don't understand. It. I mean, uh, uh, other people are going through the tribulation, I don't understand. Because God determined. It's not about you. Well, I'm just not that good. God said, well, you know what? Welcome to the club. You're a little late. The rest of us figured that out a long time ago. You're rotten. There's nothing about you that makes me do this. That's what makes the excellency of my love very different from everybody else's. Someone else may die to take someone else's place because there's something intrinsically good they see about that person or that situation. God's saying, this thing is utterly bankrupt and destitute. You are yet without strength, and when you were yet sinners, I loved you so much, I determined that you were never going to go through this wrath. Never. And now I've made a provision that makes sure that'll never happen. And I've given you a promise. I've called it your hope. And what I want you to do is to be persuaded in your mind that what I have told you is true. That's why I told you one of the hardest things to do is to change people's minds. Look, by and large, the human race is not bright. We think stuff. I'm not saying we're not smart in ways. I'm just saying we do, in this area. We think stuff, and it just does. Hey, I've, you, oh, there have been times I've said about someone, it wouldn't matter if Jesus Christ came down with the host of holy angels and declared to them in plain language. They would go, well, I mean, I just don't see it that way. I mean, that's just how stupid people are. I want to carry a dunce cap around with me so when I run into them, I can stick it on their head and say, go stand in the corner. Because they don't see... Sorry, I got carried away, didn't I? I'm sorry. Sorry, good Mike is coming back now. Okay. Sorry, I don't know what happened there. A little dual personality thing. I don't know. It's because... <laughs> Okay, here's bad, Mike. <laughs> okay, here, but look, here, my point, you, you get my point is that God has made a sure promise. He's already made it to you, and now in verse 9, he's going to give it to you again that you are, well, let me just read it for you. We shall be saved from the wrath through him. We're going to be saved. Hey, That's what this whole thing is about, convincing you that you're going to be delivered from that. And when someone says, well, I mean, I don't know. I listen to a guy on TV. It's just the God of the universe. It's just his determination, his provision, and his promise. I understand some nitwit stood up on TV, and you're not sure. I get it. That's just what, where's my marker? I just don't. Look, I got persuaded way back in Romans. I got persuaded at the end of Romans 3. That's all I needed. Everything after that has been nothing more than just beating a dead horse for me. Now, I'm not saying everybody should get it at the end of Romans 3. You may have got it before that. The only thing I'm saying is when I get to the Romans 3, I've seen everything I need to see to know beyond the shadow of a doubt that everything that could possibly, every question that anyone could ever say to me, if someone came up and said, well, you don't think we're going through the tribulation, what about this verse? I have no problem with that. They can do that all day long. It doesn't matter. Well, right here in Second Peter it said, I'm not worried about that. Well, the Bible says over here in Matthew that if you don't, well, I'm not worried about that. Because what I know is that in the dispensation of grace, he promised me I have a hope that says I'll be delivered from that day of wrath and that eternal day of wrath, and I get those two days replaced with something else. 
And then he says, and the reason that I did that, I want you to understand why I did this. It's not, Mike, because you're good or because you're righteous or because you, you teach the Bible or because you live in imperial. Although God said that's really close. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's... Oh, anyway. Lord, I'm talking to unbelievers. I don't know what to do. I don't know what... Okay. He's not looking at any of that. He says, here's the thing. Because of my love for you, I have determined that you will not. And it's not like anybody else's redemption. It's not like anybody else's love because I'm the one you committed the crimes against and it's worthy of death. And you know what I did? I stepped up and died for you. And it's just out of me. It's just me. Wow. So if I'm going to doubt him on that, that's sort of like slapping him in the face. That's my opinion. That's how that appears to me. To be a, a great insult to what he has done, what he has promised, what he has written, what he has affirmed. And for me to say, well, I'm not so sure about it. Well, I just want to know whose word you would take. And please don't tell me some sawed-off shrimp on TV or some guy that wrote a book. God wrote a book. I just said, oh, okay. It is on the basis of that that verses 9 and 10 say what they say. That's where we're going to go next week. And then we'll get to, when we get to the end of those two verses... We will wrap all of this up so that you understand exactly how this works to combat those attacks against your hope. You'll see exactly how this works. You'll see why you can be fully persuaded that this is true. That it's not, I really hope that's right. Or it's not, well, that's pie in the sky. Or that's... That's a pipe dream. Those guys, he got that back when he was a Baptist. Uh, they all say that kind of stuff. You, 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 look, you can call it pie in the sky all you want. I'm going to tell you, I can read it in plain language, what he promised me. And it doesn't matter to me if the whole world lines up on the other side and declares it not to be true. I'm going with him. Okay, me and Robert, over here. Look, I'm just saying, I, I know I'm kind of preaching to the choir here. I understand that. But there's somebody listening to this video that they've been inundated their whole life with the attack against this thing, and it is awfully hard for them to do this. What we have to do, what I have to do, what needs to happen is that we need to go through all 10 of these verses and put, to this, put this whole thing together because you, and by the way, it's not about me coming up with a clever way to say it. That's not what effectually works in you. It's these words that effectually work to produce that in us. It's that, it's that understanding of the love of God that fully persuades us in our mind that this is true. And when that happens, that has effectually worked in you to shed abroad God's love in your heart. And that is the antidote for all of the venomous attacks of the policy of evil. Okay, so we'll read the next two verses when we come back next time. And we'll finish up this first section because verse 10 has two very interesting phrases in there. It says in verse 10, we're reconciled to God by the death of his son, and, it, and then it says much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. I don't know what you're thinking. Wait, I thought we were saved by his death. I, there's a verse that says that we got saved because of the death of Jesus. Now he's telling us we got saved by his life. He said, we got reconciled by his death and saved by his life. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Just because, look, it's going to be great. It's going to be good. You'll enjoy it. <laughs> I hope. 
We'll look at these verses. And when you understand what he's talking about in those two phrases, then I think you'll be able to take everything that's in this first section of Romans 5 and you'll be able to see the truth of God's love effectually working to be produced in you so that you never have a doubt about this again. That's, that's, that's the goal. Now, if I could just put it in you, I would. I can't. God has to do that. So we'll just take our time and get it done.